Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Listen in as we discuss all things business, growth, and marketing with business owners, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, founder of Roundhouse, the creative agency, Saul Edmonds. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Katie Appett around the topic of storytelling and music composition. Hi, Katie, how are you going today? I'm going really well, Sol. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. It's really, um, it's really great to have you on today. I'd like to um, just generally sort of start by giving everyone just a bit of an overview, um, and then you can continue on with um, sort of most of it um, about who you are and what you do. So you're obviously in the business of music composition, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, so could you just let everyone know um, very broadly about, you know, in a short annotated version of, of like your history, um, generally what you do and, and I think also especially how you came to be a music composer in the first place? Sure, I can do that. Um, I'm unlike a lot of classical music composers in the way that I started composing. I I write music for classical ensembles, so for orchestras, choirs, chamber music. I'd like to get into film, but I have never um, sort of gotten around to it. My work has gotten busy along the way. Mm. And I teach composition at the University of Melbourne at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. Mm. So I'm really lucky to be able to um, write music for commissions and also to teach in the field that I love. But I didn't start writing music, particularly classical music, till I was 28. In fact, I never really did music at school, although I did learn lots of different instruments along the way. But I was one of those kids that sort of looked out the window. I wasn't particularly involved in the music school. But I was like most kids. I was in I was in the choir um, for a few years and I, I learned the drums for a little while. But it wasn't until I was 28 that I, I went along to a, a conference to learn a little bit more about um, conducting because that was interesting to me. And I found myself at all of composition uh, meetings And I came back from that meeting and I said to my husband at the time, I have to be a composer. I think I have to try this. And when he heard that and my parents were like, well, where where has this come from? We don't understand. You really think you want to go back and start being a composer? And so I I went back to university, which I swore I would never go back, and and then did a a master's or a graduate diploma in composition first, then a master's and then a PhD. And along the way um, had my children and my career has sort of grown up alongside them. So I felt very intimidated going into a classical music environment at the age of 27, 28, because if I, like I suppose if I, had been, if I was able to class myself in a particular genre of music, I would, I was singing and I would sing jazz and pop, not super well, but it was fun to do. Mm. So to, to move into a classical environment was, uh, was quite intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, I can, I can really relate to that from a range of different points of view, but especially given that most people, I think if you went, if you asked, most people and sort of said what would be your impression of this particular industry or what would be your impression of a person who's you know a a composer for orchestral music they would probably have a particular idea and like heaps of things it's kind of founded on their you know what's provided to them in the media or you know what they generally think that kind of means so it's it's really great hearing hearing like that story which is kind of in many ways so different to what many people might expect no I think that's great and then just on the off the back of the topic that that we've got to just this um initial first sort of question I've just been really interested in um how you view 
yourself, like given that the topic that we're talking about today is kind of about um, storytelling, do you consider yourself to be or view yourself to be a storyteller? I absolutely do. Although it's taken me quite a few years to get to that point. If I look back, I can see right from the very first pieces that I was writing that I'm a storyteller, but I didn't have the words to describe that for myself. So it's only in recent years that I've, look, I've looked at it and I've owned it and now I'm very deliberate about it. I love being a storyteller. And one of the things that I learned about myself last year, which was felt like a big weight was taken off my shoulders, um, was that I realised maybe I'm not so much a musician but an artist who uses music to tell stories. And once I understood that or could articulate that for myself, I can really see how everything I've done to date has um, has been along those lines. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's certainly something I've sort of once again, I can really relate to that in, you know, when you've got... Um, you know, like a lot of people, like you're interested in a, a lot of different things, um, creative things or other things in general. And then when you've got like the idea of storytelling, it seems to be in sort of many ways at the heart of a lot of different creative pursuits. You know, if you're, and you saying it in that sort of way, um, it, it certainly really resonates with me too that you're you know you obviously have to have a certain level of skill in order to do it and in order to you know to piece things together and to bring all the pieces of the puzzle together but then being the storyteller in the first place to have uh would you consider you know of you know using that term people having a vision about what that is whether it's somebody else's story that then you're kind of helping them to to bring into into the world of music and then to um, accentuate that or whether you know then it's your your vision it's still ultimately always your vision I mean what do you think about that oh I think anything's up for grabs but what I personally like to do um, although I have taken other people's stories and used them to set to music um, for example, I wrote a, an orchestral piece called The Peasant Prince and it uses the story, uh, it's, a, it's a children's book called The Peasant Prince by Lee Xuan Singh, who might be better known to people as Maya's last dancer. Mm. He's the, um, the boy from China who, who became one of the world's greatest ballet dancers and he wrote Maya's last dancer, which was turned into a, a Hollywood blockbuster film. Mm. But his children's book I used um, to create a, a piece for narrator and orchestra, which is a little like um, Peter and the Wolf, I suppose. I don't know if you remember that from when you were a kid. And so there's a narrator and an orchestra and it talks through the words from the book but sets to music the, the imagery and the illustrations within the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, However, most of the time I like to, um, I like, I quite like the absurd and the abstract um, and, and bringing them together so that they bump into reality. And that probably sounds a bit obscure, but an example of that is, is a project, I'm doing a series of projects called Hidden Thoughts. And Hidden Thoughts 1 is a one-hour uh, show. It's for six singers and six instrumentalists. And I procured the words that the singers sing by sending out a Google survey into the world. And I asked women for their hidden thoughts. And I asked them what they'd like to be brave about and what they'd learned to be brave about already, what they'd like to be braver about and whether they had hidden thoughts. And I got hundreds of responses from all over the world, but mostly Australians um, between 18 and 75. And I, I used the words in the surveys as, um, as the text in the piece. And so because I was hearing from all of these different people, I, I realised doing that project how interested I am in what lies under the surface and things 
and and how people interact with the world while having a whole different inner rich life and they're the kind of stories that I'm interested in telling yeah that's I think that's actually that's pretty good segue into something that I was gonna um I was gonna bring up with you that I I'm you know, looking at your work something that really caught my eye and then listening to it of course as well was that uh the work at that you did um, that introduced um, species was something visually um, straight away, like looking at it, it caught my imagination for a few different reasons that uh, you were saying it was uh, the original inspiration from the Australian painting by uh, Matthew Quick. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. He's a, he's a Melbourne artist. Yeah. And then it was, um, can you tell us just a little bit, about the the history behind that because that it had a real um I, I i think i kind of know why if i was if i was to analyze it, i'd probably be here for 10 minutes just kind of analyzing with the amount of kind of metaphors floating around is pretty um it was pretty interesting but certainly what you were saying before i could really see um your enjoyment of things that are a bit absurd is certainly like you can see that really obviously in that. So can you tell us a little bit about that one? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you for bringing this particular piece up. Before we press record here, I mentioned that I, there were two pieces that I could talk around in regards to storytelling, and this was this was one. So introduced species. Um, it took me a while to compose. I had I had a year or a year and a half to write it, and it's 20 minutes in, in length. And because I had such a long time, it enabled me to go quite deeply into the to into the storytelling and the metaphors and the cross-pollination between the ideas, which was really exciting. And as a composer, it's fantastic to be able to spend that time developing the richness and the sophistication in the work. But it came about when I had an artist studio in Melbourne's Abbotsford Convent. And my my studio was along the same corridor as Matthew Quick. And he was developing a series of works called Introduced Species. And they're just so absurd and beautiful um, that I I watched him over weeks paint this particular uh, painting called Intrepid Travellers, which depicts this gorgeous silky ocean with these massive rubber ducks sitting on them. And in the course of conversation, he was telling me that in 1992, nearly 30,000 bath toys fell off a ship that was going from Hong Kong to the US and uh, were, were kind of, in his words, released into the ocean. And at first it was considered an environmental disaster having all of this plastic in the ocean but oceanographers got on the path and decided that they would track the ducks and the ducks were found all over the world and they learned so much about the ocean currents wow. and from there they found that a lot of the ducks were were swimming around in uh, what the americans call the trash vortex and what we call the north pacific garbage patch which i didn't understand was such a huge array of ocean current and it's filled with rubbish and Mm. this whole angle of ideas and caught my attention and and inspired me I, i loved the ideas of the ducks swimming around as though they were sentient beings in the in the ocean and so i asked matthew whether i could use his painting from the series introduced species as a launching point for my piece and this was a piece for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra uh, for their education program where they were taking the piece the the following year into schools and recording it as well and oh there's my dog Um, and so I I thought about the ship It's, it's in three movements and the the story in my own mind was that the first movement was these ducks are held captive on the ship destined for an American bathtub and what they really wanted to be was released into the ocean and be free. So it's a little bit Disney-esque, the music, I I suppose, in the first part. The second 
The second movement is only four minutes long, but it depicts the 10 second fall of the when the ducks escape the ship and are falling to the surface of the sea. But I imagine them caught up with the sunlight and the gorgeous water dappling in the in the uh, in the ocean and then feeling that sense of freedom and so the music although it's in slow motion is very fast and it gives it was really fun to play with the sense of um speed and and the different um you know slow against fast in that movement and then find the final movement is about the ducks hitting the surface of the sea and and we realize that they're just bits of rubber in the trash vortex and the the music's really dirty and grimy and gritty and it, it's quite evocative from a storytelling perspective and i can i can talk you around more more of that if 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 that's oh, interesting yeah. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, like I, I love, I love a range of different ideas there and that things, things are constantly sort of shifting in their meaning and that you've got these things that, um, because my first thoughts was you've got like everybody intuitively just relates to rubber ducks having like a certain role. They're just little cutesy things you have and they float around and you enjoy them and they don't really do anything. They just float there and, you know, when you're a kid, it's got a certain emotional sort of connection and then taking that to this other level where you've got however many hundreds or thousands there were um, and then all of a sudden it, they transform them into, you know, either something like, you know, an army of ducks or then or then you explaining the fact that, which was like <laughs> just sort of blew my mind a bit about them actually being used for this way to track and to do like real interesting uh, research about the Earth's oceans is is just sort of crazy absurd at the same time. But ultimately, there's still just a whole heap of plastic that really shouldn't be in the ocean at all, but do probably in some ways um, less harm than other rubbish that sort of sinks down and and can be harmful. At least that kind of float. Um, <laughs> It's true. A, a really funny anecdote um, when I was re doing my research about the ducks was that um, if you find one on a beach and they're still out there, you can probably get about a thousand dollars for them on eBay. <laughs> How so funny! A collector's item as well. That that's so funny. Um, so with on the um, sort of topic too with that particular piece. Um, can you just go over again as as to how you uh, you obviously had that inspiration, but um, am I right in saying you weren't really commissioned then to do that? That was a part of another program. No, it was a commission um, from the Melbourne Symphony, right? And luckily, with this particular commission, because they come in all sorts of sizes and uh, with different kinds of constraints, the the project brief was to create a, a 20 minute piece for the orchestra to take into schools and mm. so it had to be suitable to um to take in, to be able to take into school so musically as well as have some have some depth and richness around the uh, programmatic idea around the piece so that i could talk to that and then put we what we did was pull the piece apart in front of the students and so well, this was how I did this and this is what this means and who wants to come up and help with X, Y and Z, for example. I also used plastic and I asked the orchestral players or some of them to play plastic bags. So we had to audition the plastic bags as to which kind of bag would create the best sound, firstly to be heard, but didn't have too much or too little crunch factor and that kind of thing, but also not ruin the... Uh, the instrumentalists instruments for example so the students helped us mm. with that and then after the sort of pulling apart of the symphony we then heard it in full the orchestra were able to play it but wonderfully is the mso gave me full license to just do whatever i thought was appropriate and what i wanted so there wasn't a particular they didn't ask me to to take that theme i could go really where wherever i wanted with that Hmm. Is is that is that kind of scenario for you something that is more the norm? At, like when you get a brief, 
um, because as as a as like another person who receives briefs all the time from from clients, there's always um, there's always different levels of what people would like from you, and sometimes. Um, like you were saying with that one it had to be a certain length. It was for a certain audience. And, uh, but from your perspective, when you get a brief, say on, on average across the majority of briefs you get, are most of them like that where you have the opportunity to have a lot more creative freedom and imbue um, whatever you either wish to or what you think suits it really the best. Yeah, I understand. Um, most of the time these days I get as much creative freedom as I'd like. The constraints that are usually always there are around duration because cost is often a factor in, in how long a piece is mm. or how many instruments a piece has. So um, the cost of writing a solo piece or an orchestral piece is very different because it's it's way harder or more time consuming to write an orchestral piece for a minute than a solo bassoon piece for a minute, for mm. example. So the, the duration is usually set. Normally um, the instrumentation is is set because it might be an organisation or chamber group or singer who's asking you to write. So you've got that as a constraint. However, these days most people know my sound or they know the kind of ways that I work and, and the things that I the kind of composer that I am. So they've chosen to commission me, I suppose, for a reason because they like those sounds. Mm. So they just allow me to to go where I'd like to with it. I have a commission coming up with the Sydney Symphony. It's a, it's a, just a small one. Um, they've got a project called 50 Fanfares and they're commissioning 50 composers to write a fanfare each. Mm. So my instrumentation is set, the duration is set, but also the the theme is somewhat set. It's a fanfare. It's the concert opener. So it would be inappropriate to come up with a funeral march for that concert opener, I think. So in some ways the vibe is set. But I can do that I can do whatever I want with that and, and take it as sideways as I'd like. Yeah, sure. Have you just um out of interest too, with the different sort of commissions and people that you end up working with, have you had much um, sort of exposure over the years to um, the corporate world wanting um, to, to, uh, to utilise your services for, um, for things like to you know, sell products or to um, in more of you know, that sort of sense? Uh, not to commission me, more to... Uh, use existing recordings right. perhaps for a, a film or a play or um, an ad. Mm. Yeah, because you've got, you know, I suppose, uh, which leads a little bit into the um, the next question that I was going to ask, but, you know, when people, I've, I've sort of noticed over the years, like this has been for quite a while now, but there seemed to have been a point um, in, it was hard to give a time on it, but the last 10 or 15 years where, where there seemed to be soundtracks and things were like from an advertising point of view, as like someone who looks at things that are happening on ads or when people are trying to sell particular products or services and they use particular ads, um, and they use like music in a certain way. And there seemed to have been a shift some time ago, which I'll, I'll put at the moment at, I don't know, so 10 to 15 years ago, hypothetically, um, about when they seem to change that to start using more and more existing artists' work because, and I mean, I kind of put that down to, in my my theory, was that, was that people started to recognise that, you know, in order to have a completely different, more unique emotional content to whatever that was they were trying to convey, that there's certainly a lot of limitations are put on that when you're often just 
you know, saying, I want some, a soundtrack for an ad to sell a car, you know, <laughs> example, you know, they started to realize at certain point that the even more of the value of things that are really unique and to utilize that. And, and, and I sort of started to notice, I would hear, you know, some particular artist who then, or then even now you would go, well, that artist isn't um, a huge pop star. They're like, and what you might classify as a more alternative artist, but somehow their music is being used. And I always, that always kind of struck me as quite interesting as an interesting shift in that whole, um, and I mean, you know, who knows what, um, for whatever reasons, but I think like the point kind of remains that the realization of things that are unique is still has a really important role. And it just goes into my next um, thing I was going to ask you about, which is, and this is a pretty big question. This is pretty broad. So please feel free to be more specific in your answer. But um, as to what role you kind of see having in society broadly, I mean, people use it for enjoyment generally. And, but that idea of like an emotional connection that music really kind of does better than almost anything else, I think. Um, and it always proves to be so crucial to the experience of, of any performance or any film or any animation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, um, Katie? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I love, what I love about music is that it has the ability to bypass what I call the chatter in your head and mm. it can it can just cut through um it can it can just cut through all the bullshit really to get to the heart of things and it can take listeners to where they need to be to open up to go into a space where they can understand themselves or understand at least how they feel because it can it can bring up emotion um for better or worse i guess i should say yeah that's right exactly yeah one of the ways that I love to use music in a storytelling way and I guess it's I want to connect with my audience on a human level but I want the audience to be able to connect with themselves. So I always picture my job as a storyteller to bring up what I call, I think visual artists use this term, it's called negative space and it's the, mm. it's the space around, for example, an object on a painting that's, that makes the object pop out. So people see the object, but why they see the object is because of what's around the object. And if you think, well, if I think about that musically, I like to dig in and find out what's inside that negative space because it's often, it's, it's hard to define, it's hard to name. We all feel it, we all know it. And what is it? So I, and it often sits just under the subconscious and this probably doesn't make any sense at all, but Perhaps uh, an example of what might be in the negative space would be, say, an elephant in the room, something that people all know, all know is there, but no one's talking about it. It's not the, ob the central object. And so what I like to try and do is dig into that and bring that into the fore. I would have loved to have explained that differently. <laughs> no, I, I think it, no, I think it's, one, it's really relevant, and two, I think it actually explained that really well considering that, like it's far easier to explain it when you see something visual because um, the, the, um, you're right, as, as being a visual artist myself and a, a designer, negative space can sometimes make or break a design. It's what you, one, what you do have around it or then what you don't have around it. So if you've got an example is that if you've got um, a very small amount of um, or very small um, lettering on a big space, the feeling that it generally has is that it makes it feel more precious. That you've got, it feels more special and more precious because one, it's on its own and because it's the only thing on the page and anything else, you know, so you, you automatically focus on it, but it's got a certain, like it conjures up a certain feeling or then it can feel yeah. lonely yeah. or then, 
it's what it's what the it's what so you know you talking about that on, on that subconscious level is still you know is exactly i think on the money too because those things about space and it being important or not important i think probably if you if you had a um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist and on this I mean, a conversation that have I'm plenty to say about that, but mm-hmm. it's still really relevant about um, the way people perceive the world too, as to whether that, you know, that might mean for some people that it's important and for other people, they might not like that. They might want it to be filled up with things and they feel uncomfortable of it being alone and you working in the visual space are able to really give concrete examples of that, which is which is fantastic. The only visual space that I work in, I suppose, is the musical score. And I try to be mindful of what the instrumentalist is reading. So if I've squashed up a whole lot of bars on a page to save paper, but it's a very spacious, airy sound, I'm giving the instrumentalist conflicting um information it's like putting your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time because they're hearing something spacious but it looks really squished on the page so i try and space that out on the page for them so that it matches the um the sound yeah the only thing that i can think of that relates to what you're saying as i think that we've always found too given that we apart from static imagery we do things like motion graphics and do animation. So we've always found too that from both sides that music will give meaning to things that are animated and animations will give a certain level of new introduced meaning sometimes then to music, which was, I'm I'm saying that too, because when I was um, having a look at, uh, at your work, Introduced Species, I noticed that then you had there were other animators who were given the um, and the task then to interpret like your work too. So you've got this great cycle of you being influenced by um, a painting and going through that whole process and then in turn other people bringing like sometimes new meaning to it that you listen to it on its own. Then you listen to it when you're looking at somebody else's interpretation of animation um as being influenced by it to create that and then you've got like a whole another layer of meaning which is great i mean it's it's completely organic i love that you yeah i love that you you mentioned that and i love that the animators wanted to respond to the music that the animation came after the music and when i saw the animations which were done by three different animators all in very different animation styles I heard the music differently. It totally, the yeah. allowed me to hear the music differently, and that was that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I guess, I'm saying that too because we did this little project, which was years ago, uh, a another part of of how we actually started our business. But you may not actually know this, but we actually started our business originally doing sort of sound design and music uh, when we first started the business and we did this little project when we didn't have virtually any work um and my wife who's who's the musician you know in in our um in the business we did this project for essentially for fun where we we did uh we just had this loose theme and we had i think it was like about 15 second soundtracks and we just invited people that we had met online who were who did animation just to with a, a completely open brief um, just to be inspired by that and and to do whatever they wanted as a result and when i saw that i was like oh that's that's probably like we did that purely from a um uh you know enjoyment point of view it wasn't it was our own brief we created um, just to see what what would happen, and the results are always. What's your experience of that, Saul? Oh, the experience was kind of twofold. One, 
there was from people that we didn't, there was only a couple of those people that we invited that we actually knew very well at all. And so we just went out to the kind of design community at the time with people all around the world from completely different areas that whose work we sort of liked, but we didn't really know that well. And we just, we just said, would you like to be a part of this? And the experience was, was very much like what you said was that we just put these soundtracks out without that we we generated fairly quickly that were in a range of different styles um all made through electronic music and then the meaning that that gave to them through people's interpretation was just vastly so vastly different to whatever we could have really imagined and it was really interesting and, and sort of quite inspiring um at the time and it supr- comes back to the storytelling in a way doesn't it it's it's people's different interpretations of the same idea which which adds breadth yeah that's right and the um the stories because we didn't have a story for them in the first place the only the theme that we made up because we figured we had to have a theme we had to like had it had to be tied into something was the theme of um hear no speak no evil um you have the three monkeys doing the you know hear no mm-hmm. uh, speak no um see no evil and that was that was the only theme that there was and then we just said here's the theme just make an animation to that and um expectedly there was a lot of the people were saying, what do you want us to do? I said, we don't care, do whatever you want to do. We don't want to, we don't want to give you any direction because that's the whole point of it. And the process was, you know, that creative process of just handing that over to somebody. And that was the original reason for doing it was to do that. It wasn't for any other reason aside from that was, was fantastic. And that's always kind of been something that, been wanting to do again but then seeing how that happened in in your piece i was like oh that's you know that does actually happen a a lot in in the creative industries across you know that cross-pollination of of inspiration between things um Mm -hmm. but i think just as as one of the last um things we'll cover today i'd just like to ask if you've got any any top tips we'll call it top tips i'm um, like for budding um composers like for people who i mean maybe like yourself had been um are thinking that this is something that they'd really love to do but they don't they don't know where to start or they don't know you know what to do i mean what would you say to them um well i, I guess what I would say would go across most creative platforms. It doesn't necessarily have to be music composition. I think one of the hardest things is that when you find yourself in that creative hole, which I inevitably do in every single piece that I write, you have to find your way out of it. And uh, I heard a a lecture by the fabulous John Cleese of Monty Python. Mm. He gave a lecture in... the early 90s, I think, that's on YouTube somewhere. And I heard him talk about the idea of sitting uncomfortably and becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. He said, sometimes we grasp for the first solution that comes our way when we're stuck in a hole. And it's not necessarily the best solution. It's just that we're so happy to be to find ourselves with a, a possibility of escaping that feeling of being uncomfortable that we 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 go and grab it and he said if you can and, and I do try and do this now if I can sit uncomfortably and be comfortable with being uncomfortable I can often come up come up with four or five solutions to um, getting out of the mess that I found myself in <laughs> and often the fourth or the fifth one is a hell of a lot better than the first one so i I think that's that's a real truth for me and it's it's one that i i see 
oh, I mean, we're human. We don't like being uncomfortable, right? We're constantly trying to get out of that. So I, I see that as a, as a truth. And I guess getting started, for me, it's about listening to myself. So often I'll play around with ideas, and in my case, they're musical ones. And sometimes I have to I have to create space around me in order to understand which ideas are going to stick. And that's often just by I just sit quietly cross-legged on the floor and shut my eyes. And if I'm conflicted about which way to go, it's it's I can often know which way to go just even within 10 or 20 seconds of, of sitting quietly and allowing myself that space. I, I tell myself I'm going to sit there for half an hour or until I've come up with um, a decision, but but often the decision sort of comes to me quite quite quickly. Sometimes we, yeah, I, I don't know how to explain that better, but just to, I, I, I create space around myself to know how to, to go forward and, and that's hard in our busy world. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I do, I'm certainly relate to that and I relate to all of that and I think for, you know, sometimes when you look back on who you were when you were the person who was looking for advice and you weren't quite, you know, quite sure about what that is. I think advice like that too is really relevant for a few reasons. I think, I think in one way that just comes from experience and, and you'll never probably necessarily just, you know, you can't necessarily learn that. However, I think that it's still, there's, it's still just as, as valid to make people aware that that's an important thing because they'll you know, come to their own realisation of it. There's not all those things aren't always things you can just, you know, kind of turn on and off. They're, they're a bit hard. I, I still have to come to grips with things like that of thinking something is a great solution and then, um, then it's really not and you really have to go through a bit of a painful process to come to the right one. But that's, mm. but I think, yeah, I think maybe what I mean, you were getting at and just um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but is that kind of that uh, acceptance of it, you know, of kind of accepting that, that that's okay. It's not a big deal. You know, that if you do, if you do have something and you have to end up chucking it away altogether, and going, that was a big waste of time. As long as you come to the, the right solution at some point, that's just that acceptance of that not being too, um, I mean, it's inevitably going to always be frustrating. Uh, that never kind of goes away. But, you know, as long as it's I'm sort of okay, what do you reckon? I can... Yeah, I agree. I think nothing's a waste of time. It's all part of getting to the end result. And sometimes there are, um, you know, there's more more than one way of moving forward and they all could be good. And so you have to mm. make that decision. But I think, um, so I've just, I want to go back to something that you just said and I've lost it. Um, oh, sorry, my no, brain is right. tired now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but the, I, I, I think... agree. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I think, I think those sorts of things are, um, you know, any any help, especially in like the creative industries, but generally in in business, I always feel very grateful. You know that I know different other people in business, or or and or in the creative industries, but even just then other businesses that you can bounce ideas off and. I think, yeah, with that idea, especially given the current um, environment where people um, really need to pull together even more and kind of help each other out, you know, those sorts of things about giving advice to people, um, you know, free advice, I think is really important. But um, at, at this point, what we'll do is I'll just actually get you, Katie, if you don't mind, to... Um, to give us a quote that you either like or that you find is um, sort of relevant to what we've been um, sort of talking about. Okay. Um, I've 
just would like to bring up a, a document on my desktop, if that's okay, because it's got got it written down. I wasn't going to give you this one, but <laughs> um, I, I think I might because we've talked about the things that I was going to talk about yeah. as quotes. Um, is that okay? Just yeah, sure. Um, it's a quote... Oh, yes. Here we go. I've been reading a little bit of Irish Celtic poetry recently, and I've come across uh, an Irish poet, Padraig Otoma. I'm not sure if I have his, his name pronounced correctly. And he talks about a phrase called the argument of being alive. And somehow that evoke something in me and I want to I want to find out more and I think um, he also this is the quote that I'd like to read I, do, I can't say it in Irish in any way but I'm sure it's out there somewhere on the internet mm. it's, but it it the quote is you are the place where I stand on the day when my feet are sore and it's a it's a phrase from West Kerry in Ireland and I really like this soft, kind language. And I think I look to music to say sometimes difficult and unpalatable things, but in a soft and kind way. I think mm-hmm. music provides a way to hear things that you can't otherwise hear. Oh, that's really relevant. That's fantastic. That's a good, that's a, <laughs> yeah, I can see the the, um the building of kind of metaphors and different ideas is a really important part of you know how you compose too and um thanks i mean so much again for uh, for being a part of the podcast um i'd just like to to ask you also if you can just let everyone listening know of how people can actually get um in touch with you and how they can learn more of what your um, your website address is and, and the best way to get in contact with you. Oh, thank you so much, Saul. It's a pleasure to, to be here. I really appreciate it. My website is katieabbott.com, which is dot com, And I have a, um, you can get in contact with, with me through that, through the contact page. It also has a lot of, um, uh, excerpts of my recordings up there as well as a, a online shop with my with my discs um, and links to my SoundCloud page as well for, for more listening. I've also got five albums which are up on Spotify too if people are interested. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and um, I can attest to the fact that it's pretty good listening too. It's a fantastic yeah, site. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm so... Uh, With that in mind, everybody, that's actually it for today. Thanks again um, so much for listening to our podcast. And before we go, please leave your feedback as well as any suggestions for any topics you would like us to discuss in future episodes. Thanks again for listening to the Grey Business Podcast and we'll see you again soon. Bye, guys. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Grow Your Business. Have a great day.